Lam Yohee, better known to her peers at the University of British Columbia and popular culture at large as Elisa Lam, was a bright, thoughtful, and imaginative student. Her interests in fashion and talents for writing were weighed down by the unfortunate demons of bipolar disorder and mental suppression, clouding the circumstances that most assume led to her initial vanishing and tragic death. Amateur sleuths and professional investigators alike have spent the better part of almost nine years digging theoretical tunnels and holding magnifying glasses up to anything and everything that might shed that one decisive clue in the ultimate reason behind, Elisa Lam's demise. These probes and pursuals, combined with assorted observable evidence, have only created headaches more than they've solved questions, leaving the uncracked mystery up for grabs by anyone willing to rise to the challenge. As I hope to provide a more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the bizarre circumstances surrounding Elisa Lam's confusing death. Elisa Lam was born on April 30, 1991 in Vancouver, British Columbia to two immigrants from Hong Kong, David and Yaina Lam. Her parents opened up a restaurant in Burnaby, Canada, and the family helped operate the popular dining spot called Paul's Restaurant for years. In 2010, Elisa started her first blog on the internet titled Ether Fields. Before we continue, I have a surprise for you. We've created a new channel where we upload content related to old, historical ruins and interesting events. So, subscribe to my channel, Decoverize, for daily interesting videos and show some love in the comments. Let's see who will be the first. The link is in the description. Okay, let's continue. Throughout the next couple of years, she used the platform to showcase her love of fashion and clothing, often posting magazine articles and fashion-related photography. She would also openly speak about her struggles with mental illness. Constantly fearing, her transcript would show her frequently dropped classes and sporadic college attendance. However, she also wrote honestly about her thoughts and ideas on psychology, emotion, and the human spirit. Throughout these blogs, she kept records of her own musings while sharing stories that reflected a bright mind and intelligent thinker. Written in her final blog on Ether Fields, Elisa announced she would be transferring her energy and social media presence to Tumblr, starting a page called Nouvelle Nouveau, translated as News New. On her page, Elisa shared thousands of images and pieces of writing, both her own and of various authors. It was apparent on Tumblr that she held deep-rooted interests in classical books and films, experimental art and design, and fashion and culture. Sprinkled amongst these fascinations were bits of dark and brooding images hinting at a more personal sadness and perhaps conflicted mind full of monsters, melancholy, and misery. In fact, Elisa did have a history with a couple of psychological disorders. This narrative kept under wraps by her family for months after her disappearance and death. Specifically, she was diagnosed for bipolar disorder and depression. Bipolar disorder is a mental illness that causes depression itself, in addition to instances of abnormal and elevated mood called mania or hypermania. To treat these disorders, Elisa took multiple medications such as dexedrine, welbutrine, and mood stabilizers. For most of her life, Elisa functioned without major ramifications as a result of these struggles. And until the fateful trip to Los Angeles in 2013, she had shown zero signs of breakdown or danger to either herself or to others. With these characteristics in mind, it's important to remember Elisa Lam as a human being, not a diagnosis. She was a promising student at the University of British Columbia and obviously had a plethora of ideas about the world. She had a family, hobbies, and most importantly, a future. Unfortunately, it was cut short of its potential. As the mystery of her fate began to unravel in December of 2012. Now let's explore the timeline of events leading to Elisa's death. On December 21, 2012, Elisa gives the first recorded mention of her desire to travel to the West Coast and visit a school in Santa Clara for potential transfer. A week later, on December 28, Elisa mentions on Tumblr that her cell phone has been misplaced. After the new year, on January 5, 2013, Elisa mentions planning for her West Coast tour and for the first time suggests meeting up with people via the internet. A couple of days later, on January 7, Elisa books her flight for the West Coast tour and tacks on a very eerie message regarding the future on Tumblr. Then on January 9, Elisa posts on Tumblr that due to paranoia, she has made a new Facebook account for the fifth time and reposts a blurb she had written earlier that day, before the blurb is an introduction in which she claims, this is the very start of my depression and today I am feeling very low. Fast forward to January 18th when Elisa supposedly arrives in Vancouver on her tour. 
For days later, on January 22nd, she supposedly travels to San Diego for the next leg in her journey after missing her initial flight while getting lost in the airport. On January 24th, Elisa posts on Tumblr that her trip so far has consisted mostly of activities and actions that she participates in back at home on a normal schedule. With this post, she hints at her later actions in Los Angeles when she says, every now and then, I do something entirely impulsive and reckless. A few days later, on January 27th, she posts again on Tumblr that she was out with friends at a speakeasy and had in fact lost another phone. Although this time it did not belong to her. Instead, she had borrowed her friend's old Blackberry for her trip. The next day, January 28th, Elisa arrives in LA and checks into the Cecil Hotel near Skid Row, a budget motel for tourists in the city. On January 30th, Elisa's anonymous roommates complain of her odd behavior and she is moved to a private room on the fifth floor so that she isn't a disturbance to other guests. On January 31st, the last day of her planned visit in LA, Elisa is seen for the last time by a couple of anonymous hotel workers and then finally by a clerk, Katie Orphan, at the local bookstore who mentioned Elisa was by herself, but also outgoing, very lively, and very friendly. Orphan also said she was talking about what book she was getting and whether or not what she was getting would be too heavy for her to carry around as she traveled. Because Elisa was supposed to check out of the Cecil Hotel that day and travel to Santa Cruz for the last leg on her tour, both her parents were waiting for a phone call. In fact, Elisa had called her parents almost every night during her trip despite losing her temporary cell phone. After they heard nothing from their daughter, Mr. and Mrs. Lamb flew to Los Angeles to file a missing persons report and assist the Los Angeles Police Department in their search. Throughout the first week of February, both the Lamb couple and the LAPD scoured the Cecil and the surrounding areas for any trace of Elisa. Police dogs were unable to pick up on her scent, and for the first few days, no clues were uncovered. Elisa's room that she stayed in prior to her disappearance was void of any suspicious items or signs of disturbance, an unsettling occurrence for such a strange vanishing. On February 6th, the LAPD released an official statement online. Regarding Elisa Lamb's disappearance and details surrounding the case, urging citizens to keep an eye out for her profile. A day later, they hold a press conference on February 7th, but again, receive no leads or calls from the general public. Then on February 14th, LAPD releases the biggest bombshell in the entire case, an elevator surveillance clip from February 1st showing Elisa Lamb walk in the elevator. Press a series of buttons and proceed to act in a bizarre manner. The clip was unsettling to say the least, but gave investigators one more glimpse into Lamb's final sighting and brought the case to worldwide attention. The missing person search would soon come to an end, however, when on February 19th, a Cecil Hotel worker responded to multiple guest complaints about funny smelling water and low faucet pressure. The employee went up to the rooftop water system, peered into the open tank, and discovered Elisa Lamb's naked body floating face up. LAPD was immediately notified and the water tanks soon became a crime scene. A couple of days thereafter, on February 21st, the Los Angeles coroner's office issued a label of Elisa Lamb's death as accidental due to the consequence of drowning, with bipolar disorder as a finding of other conditions contributing but not related to the immediate cause of death. On June of 2013, the full coroner's reports, along with the toxicology results, were released to the public as well. While not revealing any massive twists to the mystery, it did note that Elisa Lamb's body was indeed found naked, with her clothes also found in the water tank covered in a sandy particulate along with her keys and watch. From here on out, thousands of theories, hypotheticals, conspiracies, and simple casual conversations have been discussed through the following months and years. Nobody seemed to want to stick by the L.A. coroner's office and their findings. Many questioned the police investigation and even more saw possible holes in the final report. Regardless, the timeline of Elisa Lamb's death and its direct series of events blossomed into the most talked about case of the 21st century. Without a doubt, the most controversial and scrutinized piece of the Elisa Lamb case is the four-minute CCTV footage that the LAPD pulled from one of the Cecil Hotel surveillance tapes. Situated in the upper corner of a main elevator carriage in the northern corridor, before we dive deep into its contents, let's watch the main portion of the video. Viewer discretion is advised, the following images are unsettling and could be viewed as sensitive material. The video is a bit grainy, and segments of it are hard to clearly make out. But one thing is for certain, Elisa Lam is the subject of the footage and is clearly reacting to something. 
Now, what that something is will likely never be accounted for with 100% certainty, but it does make the clip that much stranger. It makes one wonder if Elisa is peering out of the elevator with the sense that she's being followed. One could argue she's talking out loud at certain points, possibly just to herself. Between the random buttons pressed on her entrance to the emptiness of the hallways to the undistinguished hand gestures and body positions she makes, the rhyme and reason of the video is impossible to explain on a first watch. There have also been some controversy surrounding the tape's origins. Some people across the internet claim the footage skips one minute of the time code, but because of its low quality, it's not easy to point out. Others say the footage itself has been tampered with purposefully pixelating Elisa's mouth at various points. But these reports have either been denied or flat out ignored by professionals. One thing is for sure, the elevator footage from February 1st, 2013, depicting the last known images of Elisa Lam, have conjured both worthy concern and far-fetched conspiracies, and remains the single most intriguing piece of evidence linked to the case. And now let's examine the theories surrounding the mystery of Elisa Lam's death. Since the day Elisa Lam went missing, the CCTV tapes were released and her body was discovered on the rooftop of the Cecil Hotel. Countless theories have been proposed across the internet and publications all over the world trying to unlock the secrets of the unexplainable mystery. Many of these assumptions are based purely in conspiracy theory. Some circles have drawn up wild fantasies that explain Elisa was playing an elevator game attempting to cross over into alternative universes. Others believe Elisa was possessed by spiritual forces, encountered paranormal subjects, or was contacted by otherworldly beings. These are farcical attempts to glamorize Elisa's death as science fiction or occultist and are based upon zero observable evidence connected by complex coincidental claims and hyperbole. For example, the location of the Cecil Hotel is in Skid Row of downtown Los Angeles. The area is infamous for its high crime rates and suspicious activity. Drug peddling and violent crime are common both outside and inside of the hotel, which has its own history of murder and suicide. In 1985, serial killer Richard Ramirez, dubbed as the Night Stalker, stayed in one of the 600 rooms of the Cecil in the midst of a killing spree that ended in the deaths of 13 women. Another homicide suspect, Jack Unterberger, stayed in the hotel in 1991. It was a frequent spot for those with suicidal tendencies, seeing a few people jump from the rooftop in the 1950s and 60s. It even housed another cold case, that of Pigeon Goldie Osgood, a former telephone operator whose mutilated body was discovered in her room in 1964. However, despite the criminology of the Cecil, none of it can be directly attributed to the death of Elisa. A much more plausible explanation is that Elisa Lam was followed during her time in L.A., chased in the hallways of the Cecil Hotel and subsequently murdered and placed in the water tank by a second party. Initially, this theory made sense. If you go back to multiple Tumblr posts that Elisa made throughout the end of 2012 and beginning of 2013, she was conscious about her outspoken nature and feared that one day her mouth would get her into trouble. At various points, she wrote about unsettling anxieties. One post read, I'm going out tonight. I really hope no creeper comes near me. At least twice, Elisa was convinced trouble was lurking around the corner at the fault of her tongue, saying, quote, I really need to be removed from society before my big mouth gets me in trouble and I get beaten up, as well as my mouth is my downfall and it will get me in trouble. I already do so many stupid things. I have troubles knowing where boundaries are. And it seems I always make the biggest mistakes at the worst possible moments and get caught and face consequences for me getting caught the one time I wasn't thinking and did something stupid to cut corners. Taking this into consideration, her own admission that she frequently sparked arguments with strangers around her, it is plausible she came into a confrontation at the wrong place and at the wrong time that winter. In addition to Elisa's worries is the manner in how she acts during the elevator footage. After she enters for the first time and presses the floor buttons, she waits a few moments before slowly approaching the elevator's door frame. She then quickly sticks her head out in the hallway and glances from side to side in a hurried manner, then pulling back into the elevator. She pins herself against the wall and then into the corner, acting as if she was avoiding the vision of someone from outside. She goes back to the doorframe once more and again cautiously sticks her head into the open. From here, she makes a series of random movements before pressing more buttons. When she returns outside for the final time, it appears as if she's communicating either orally or with her hands. Regardless, no one is seen and Elisa disappears from view. 
The first part of her movements could indicate she was hiding from another person, but her random footwork and dazed demeanor in the second part of the footage don't seem to make sense if she was truly on the run. The Tumblr post concerns combined with the suspicious video truly makes one wonder if there was someone involved with Elisa's death. But there are too many rebuttals to the arguments that her cause of death was homicide. For instance, there were zero bruises or signs of bodily harm on Elisa's figure, ruling out an assault. All of her belongings were accounted for besides the long-lost cell phone, ruling out robbery or attempted robbery. The eyewitness testimonies by hotel employees and the bookstore clerk claim she was completely alone and showed no signs of struggle or distress regarding another person. Cameras captured no other suspects around the time of Elisa's recording and her lack of relationships in a new territory helped rule out a planned or gestated murder as she had very little friends back at home, let alone Los Angeles. In the end, there was zero evidence confirming these theories about murder or foul play, leading us, just as the LAPD did, to rule murder out. All that being said, the official opinion of the LA chief coroner and assigned medical examiners presents a catch-22. They preface their final hypothesis with a warning that the interpretation of the evidence is limited because the sample size is small, particularly the lack of blood samples tested due to low levels. However, they then contradict themselves when they say that the police investigation ruled out foul play, but also stated, quote, a full review of the circumstances of the case and appropriate consultation do not support intent to harm oneself. The manner of death is classified as accident. So if there was no harmful intention either by Lamb herself or a second suspect, then how exactly did Elisa accidentally climb up a massive cylinder, discover it was a water tank, lift up an incredibly heavy lid and jump into the dark water? And if the lid was already open, why did she choose to climb in as a response? Murder and suicide are polar opposite explanations that have both been deemed inapplicable. Believers that Elisa was killed by somebody else linger over the fact that the rooftop access was protected by alarms on the doors and the fact that her accessing the water tanks required agility and strength. However, it has been repeatedly explained that the hotel has four different access points, three by fire escape that have no alarms and that the water tank lids were either opened or lighter than originally assumed, easily operated by a woman of Elisa's size. So now we must find the middle ground between the two explanations and justifiably theorize how such a specific unarguable set of circumstances could be regarded as an accident. The most plausible and evidential theory is that Elisa Lam suffered a manic episode due to her struggles with bipolar disorder both leading up to and on the day of February 1st. To start, we must consider the toxicology reports. Two different antidepressant medicines prescribed to Elisa were either traced directly or metabolites were traced to her heart, blood, and liver enzymes. One of these drugs was bupropion, known to sometimes cause mania in bipolar disorder. Another mood-stabilizing medicine had metabolites traced to her enzymes, but Elisa's antipsychotic medicine was not found in her system. So in review, Elisa had only taken one of her prescribed drugs the day she passed and had only taken the others recently, if not at all, in the days leading up to her death. The toxicology report also confirms that Elisa had no alcohol in her system or other recreational drugs. This rules out the possibility that she had been under the influence of substances while on camera in the elevator, or that something such as marijuana, pills, or drunkenness inspired her to climb into the tank. Her liver was not tested for rohypnol, better known as roofies. There was no urine in the system, meaning that she excreted any and all liquid waste urine that would contain traces of roofies, ketamine, or other date rape paraphernalia before entering the tank. So reflecting on the information regarding her history with mental disorders and the calculated prescription use and lack thereof, we must next understand what exactly an episode of mania is. Several mania can include psychotic features such as hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, catatonia, and lack of insight. One mental health professional uses the phrase disorganization yet appearing singularly focused. Highlighting its occurrence when Elisa presses the buttons in the elevator at random, appearing intent on some kind of agenda or direction. Symptoms of mania also include psychomotor agitation, which involves repetitive, purposeless, or unintentional movements and behaviors. Dr. Daniel Morrill reviews in a medical journal that these actions can result in the wringing of the hands, pacing, and taking off clothes repeatedly. All three behaviors were exhibited by Elisa, both in the elevator footage and in or around the water tanks. The fact that Elisa Lam attempted to go to the roof at all could be a response to hallucinations or delusions. 
What these might have been are unknown and it would be unfair to Elisa's memory to assume and fictionalize her mental illness. It is important to note that manic hallucinations are not just visual but can be manifestations of sound, smell, taste, and touch. Another possible explanation to her removing of clothing. In combination with the inconsistent prescription upkeep, the pure fact that Elisa was in a foreign location with a lack of communication back home could have set off a manic episode. The people Elisa had been staying with since she booked a shared room with fellow guests stated that Elisa was acting strangely to the point where she was bothering the others and had to be moved to another room by herself. The last piece of promising evidence supporting this theory came to us in a testimony from a confidential resident to be referenced as Resident A from Los Angeles, California, who wishes for both them and their family to be kept anonymous. After hearing about our investigation to the case of Elisa Lam and having little to no prior knowledge of the scenario, Resident A told us that a few years ago, they had a family member in Mexico commit suicide as a result of manic depression or bipolar disorder. Resident A stated that this family member died from drowning after plunging into the depths of a similar industrial water tank. Resident A also stated that this was a common occurrence for the family member who, as a result of their bipolar disorder, seeked out bodies of water whenever suffering from a bout of mania. Resident A confirmed that this family member was about 35 years old when they passed away but had been suffering from mental illness for over a decade and had an inclination to run away and find attraction to water throughout the years. While this case has no direct relation to Elisa Lam, it's peculiar that both instances involve a confirmed bipolar subject who, as a result of their condition, drowned because of an unconscious gravitation to water. There is hardly any research done in the medical or psychological field regarding this phenomena, but we are incredibly interested. If there are other situations like this one, if anything, it further suggests that Elisa's reason for selecting the Cecil Hotel's water tank may not be a mystery but a tragic symptom of her psychological illness. In the end, taking all evidence, scientific research, and social patterns into account, we've determined that the initial report from the chief coroner is accurate in that Elisa Lamb died accidentally due to drowning as an indirect result of bipolar disorder. While other theories were briefly discussed, their complete lack in observable evidence and origins from make-believe prevented them from serious consideration. The reason this case fascinated followers all over the world and produced incessant gossip and conspiracies is the fact that it's hard for people to accept simple, innocent explanations for complex and unsettling situations. Psychological disorders are heavily stigmatized, even today, but also very misunderstood. People don't want to accept that Elisa Lam was suffering from hallucinations due to bipolar disorder because that's only in her mind and they struggle accepting such indistinction. Instead, it's far easier to tell our own versions of what we want to have happened, something more fantastical or intriguing than mental illness. For example, some people believe another party was involved because Lam's cell phone was missing and her Tumblr remained active for months following her death. Yet the simple answer is her original phone was lost weeks before her trip and Tumblr will populate active accounts with posts in the likeness of their previous content for a brief time after they go dark. People also couldn't wrap their brains around the fact that Elisa made it to the rooftop and into the water tanks undetected. However, it is quite simply laid out in the undisputed material facts and supporting evidence section. Of the motion for summary judgment document after the Cecil Hotel was sued for its role in Elisa's death. In box 10, it states that, quote, the rooftop access door is equipped with an electronic alarm system which alerts hotel employees when the rooftop access door has been opened. Followed by box 14 that states, quote, the alarm for the rooftop access door was not activated at any point in January or February 2013. This means that Elisa used one of the three fire escapes to reach the rooftop, which was proven possible by an international guest at the Cecil Hotel via a YouTube demonstration. In addition, the motion for summary judgment reports in box 20 that, quote, someone could theoretically access the water tank by climbing to the top of an elevator utility room and jumping down on the water tank from above. This photo depicts the elevator utility room in question, which allows easy access from a red set of stairs and a joined ladder. The leap from that structure to the water tanks is also quite negligible as seen put to scale with the size of a human portrayed here. In terms of the elevator video, our story-centric minds want to fill in the hallways on either side of the elevator with monsters and perpetrators and supernatural phenomena. But in reality, there was nothing out of sorts on the night of February 1st, 2013. 
Only Elisa Lam truly knew what she saw and what she felt the day she disappeared. And it's up to us to trust that it was the unfortunate unpredictability of mental illness that caused these emotions and the actions that resulted as such. After all, Elisa was a young woman who had recently gone through intense emotional roller coasters with an identity crisis and building anxieties revolving around her purpose in life. She was somewhat aware of impending depression and admitted online that she could tell she was leaning towards more impulsive and reckless tendencies after the fact, a glaring sign of potential mania. She was about the age that many young people start to experience what are called breakthrough symptoms of both bipolar spectrum and schizophrenia spectrum tendencies. The unfamiliar surroundings of Skid Row, L.A., potential insomnia mixed with an absence of proper medicine compounded her confusion and eventual mania. There is no one ruling factor that led to Elisa Lam's harrowing death. Instead, it was a combination of nature and circumstance heightened by coincidental video recordings that cultivated a gross amount of inconsiderate internet conspiracy. Let this examination of the bizarre circumstances surrounding Elisa Lam's death be a step in the process of ending the stigmatization around her struggles with disorder and mental illness in general. Elisa was a wonderful human being with infinite potential. She had interests and hobbies and dislikes as all of us do. She has a family who still honor her memory. It is time for us to do the same and take lessons where we can. Look after those with mental health issues and speak up about it before we create another tragic saga like that of Elisa Lam. Lars Mittank, a compassionate and easygoing young man, was a hardworking engineer and family man of Itzaho, Germany. His free-spirited personality and love of all things traveling was cut short by an unexplainable unsolved disappearance in July of 2014, leaving all who knew him around northern Germany and the entire of the world at large. Grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis. This is an examination of Lars Mittank's unsettling disappearance at the Varna airport in Bulgaria and the mysterious CCTV footage that was released soon after. Lars Mittank was born on February 19, 1986, near Berlin, Germany. From Berlin, a young Lars and his parents moved to Mann, where his mother, Sandra, and her husband had resided alongside their families for decades. Not long after, his family moved to Itzehoe, Germany, the capital of the Steinberg district in northern Germany. Itzaho is a smaller town compared to major cities around north-central Europe, featuring a population of just 31,000 as of 2019. It is a quiet place throughout most of the year. Aside from the first weekend in August, when commuters from the nearby Wacken open air, a heavy metal music festival held in Wacken, Germany, use Itzaho shuttles for transportation. Overall, the town has a gentle aura that made raising a small family quite the easy endeavor for the Mittank couple. Thus, as Lars navigated childhood, he found it easy to make friends and always got along well with his classmates. He fit right into the soft-spoken, low-key nature of his fellow Itsoho community and found much social and educational success because of it. Lars loved outdoor activities and as a teenager, found a love for fishing and diving expeditions. He would often go on weekend excursions with his school friends, sometimes even vacationing outside of Germany to see what other European countries had to offer. Without a doubt though, Lars' favorite pastime was cheering on his favorite football club, the hometown SV Werder Bremen Greenwhites. Werder Bremen competes in the top tier of the German football league system. And while they aren't considered powerhouses of their league in the 21st century, Lars bled their colors and supported them nonetheless. He didn't care about championships and honors. He simply devoted himself to his favorite team and carried that fiery spirit wherever he went. When Lars wasn't attending Werder Bremen matches with his friends or chasing adventures around Itzaho, he was diving deep into his textbooks and studying to become an engineer. For going the traditional four-year university course, Lars went the route of a specific trade, taking extra coursework and advanced training classes to become a power plant operator at a coal-fired power plant. Lars excelled beyond expectation. And after receiving top marks in all of his courses, he found employment at the Wilhelm Shaven power plant. This new job led Lars 150 kilometers away from his family and friends back home in Itzaho and Mann, but he made sure never to forget them and kept in tight communication with everyone, a symbol of his devotion and love for those around him. That familial sacrifice was seen most drastically in 2012 when Lars's father suffered a stroke and needed special care moving forwards. 
Lars Livingdeer Vilmshaven would go home on weekends between work shifts to help Sandra take care of his father. While he could have been taking additional trips or hanging out with his friends, he chose nursing his father back to full health instead. He was always thinking of others, no matter what life threw at him. Outside of his ailing father, Lars's life was otherwise smooth sailing for two years following the stroke. In 2014, he continued his sporting ventures and enjoyed a healthy relationship with his girlfriend of several years. Everything appeared to be going as planned. That is until one of his many vacations took a turn for the worse. And after a bizarre set of events on the coast of Bulgaria, Lars disappeared, never to be seen or heard from again. Now let's turn to the timeline of events that led up to Lars' disappearance. In the early summer months of 2014, Lars Mittank decides he needs a vacation from the constant stress of balancing work and tending to his father. He and five friends, three from childhood and two from school, decide to plan a trip to Varna, Bulgaria, a coastal city along the Black Sea. It's not the normal type of vacation for Lars, but his friend's crew has an open reservation and Lars jumps on board the opportunity. On June 30th, later that season, Lars and his friends fly to Varna and check into Hotel Viva, a four-star lodge along the Golden Sands beaches on the Bulgaria Riviera. Over the next few days of the vacation, Lars breaks from his group of friends to play football with a group of high school graduates on the beach. His friends all stay behind at Hotel Viva to eat by the pool and party in their rooms. But Lars likes the physical activity and is considered a pleasant guy by the other beach footballers. At 11 p.m. on July 3rd, the fourth day of the vacation, Lars reconvenes with his five friends and they all attend the mystery of Golden Sands Bar to watch Costa Rica and the Netherlands in their World Cup quarterfinals match. Throughout the night and to the early morning hours of July 4th, Lars and his friends exchange flags of their home football clubs with others around the bar. Lars wears his Werder Bremen jersey proudly like usual and with a few drinks in both he and his friends. The flag trading with other patrons in the bar upsets a group of Bavarian high school graduates. These young men start an argument with Lars. Whether it's for his hometown jersey or ornery antics with the World Cup flags is unknown, but Lars and his friends quell their bickering and end the night on a positive note. Another few hours pass and at 4 a.m. on July 4th, Lars and his five friends are the last patrons to leave the mystery of Golden Sands Bar. Just after 4 a.m., two of Lars' friends, Tim and Paul, suggest the crew stop at a nearby McDonald's for food. Lars declines the offer. Having little appetite for fast food and considering his athletic diet for sports and nutrition, he breaks off from the rest of his friends and starts the one-kilometer trek back to the hotel. However, not long after leaving the group, Lars is attacked and beaten by a gang of either Russians or Bulgarians. He escapes without any major injuries except for a torn eardrum due to a blow to the left side of the head and returns to Hotel Viva to sleep it off. After a few hours of rest, Lars wakes at noon on July 4th and immediately phones his girlfriend. He tells her of how he believes that the gang that attacked him was hired by the FC Bayern Munich fans that argued with him at the Golden Sands Bar. Remembering how they told him the night before that hiring someone to beat someone else up for money isn't that difficult in Bulgaria. Lars' girlfriend pleads with him to get his ear checked out by a doctor. But Lars says he doesn't think there would be a medical office open on the weekend. He goes on to tell his girlfriend he hopes his ear will heal naturally and ends the conversation. That same evening, Lars rejoins his friends once more for a night of celebration and drinking in town. No further incidents occur and everyone has a great time. The same good fortune continues over the weekend on both July 5th and 6th as Lars and the crew relax at their hotel and the vacation winds down to an end. On July 7th, just before 12 p.m., Lars checks out of the hotel but still can't shake the pain he has in his left ear from the fight. He realizes flying with a hurt ear could damage his hearing and slow him down at his job. So he hails a cab with one of his friends and visits a doctor's office. Between 12 and 1 p.m., Lars is checked out by a practitioner who diagnoses him with a ruptured eardrum and tells Lars he cannot fly in his current state. Instead, the doctor refers Lars to the St. Anna Hospital in Varna for additional assistance. Before going to the hospital, however, Lars returns to Hotel Viva and rendezvous with his friends later that afternoon at 5 p.m. Lars implores everyone to fly home without him, saying he'll find a way back to Germany after treatment via travel insurance. A few hours later, at around 8 p.m., a shuttle bus picks up Lars's five friends from Hotel Viva and takes them to the airport. Lars waves goodbye and climbs into a separate cab of his own that transports him to St. Anna Hospital. 
A mere 40 minutes pass by before Lars is examined by an ear, nose, and throat specialist in St. Anna at 8.40 p.m. However, in a strange twist, there is a communication debacle between the ENT specialist and Lars. Thus, Lars is never admitted to St. Anna but does receive a prescription for 500 milligrams of Cefprazil, a common antibiotic used for ear infections. At 9.41 p.m., Lars exits St. Anna and finds the same cab that dropped him off, still parked outside the hospital's entrance. Lars climbs inside and asks the driver to take him to the nearest pharmacy. The pharmacy in question isn't carrying enough Cefprazil tablets to fulfill Lars's prescription and so he asked the cab driver to take him to a second pharmacy. At 10.05 p.m., Lars finally receives his full order of Cepersil and asks the cab driver to take him to one final destination, a cheap hotel. The cab driver informs Lars that due to the popular summer season, almost all of the hotels in the area would be booked. However, he knows of one possibility, and drives Lars to the Hotel Color Varna, a small lodge in a poorer area of the city. Five minutes later, at 10 p.m., Lars arrives at Hotel Color and pays his cab driver with a hefty tip. He thinks about grabbing water at the convenience store across the street, but notices a few men dressed in dark clothing milling about and thinks better of it. Instead, Lars checks in at the front desk of Hotel Color and pays for his room with a credit card. Between this time and 11 p.m., Lars ventures down to the hotel bar and fills up on water there, both to quench his thirst and so he can take these Cefrazil tablets. Just after 11, Lars' behavior begins to change and he calls his mother, Sandra, from his cheap cell phone. Because he left his new smartphone back home in Germany, his lesser phone needed minutes charged to it to make outgoing calls. Lars asks Sandra to put money towards the phone minutes, to which she agrees. This is where Lars finally informs his mother about the weekend's events. He tells her about the argument in the Golden Sands bar, the fight with the soccer fans, the ruptured eardrum, and how the ENT doctor mocked him and refused to speak to him in English, laughing him out of St. Anna. Sandra is understandably perturbed about her son's stories, but she tells him she'll file a claim with foreign health insurance to secure a patient transport back to his home in Germany. A few minutes pass by, and Sandra calls Lars back. She tells him about the health insurance claim failing, to which Lars responds with more cryptic behavior. He tells Sandra that he needs to leave because there is something off about hotel color. He goes on to ask Sandra to cancel his credit cards because apparently the front desk clerk had copied his credit card upon check-in and that bothered him as he had never witnessed that process at a hotel before. Sandra double-checks with the bank to make sure she can cancel the cards and unblock them later, but the bank assistant tells her it's not possible. Nevertheless, Lars pleads with his mother to cancel them anyway, claiming to have enough cash on hand. Another couple of minutes go by and Sandra books Lars a bus out of Varna for the following night at 11.30 p.m. on July 8th. She implores her son to get a good amount of sleep and rest up for the next day's journey. Before the clock can strike midnight, however, Lars calls Sandra once again, this time more paranoid than before. He goes on about something being wrong with the hotel but doesn't go into further detail acting as if his room was wiretapped and someone is recording his every move. Sandra tries to comfort her son but Lars ends the call saying he needs to get out of there. Sometime between 2.30 and 3 a.m. Lars calls Sandra once more whispering to her that he's being followed by four men who want to kill him. Lars sounds more frightened than ever before but hangs up soon after calling. At 3.06 a.m., Lars texts Sandra asking her what, quote, Cefzil 500 is. He repeats the text again at 3.15, apparently confused by his Cefprazil tablets. At this point, Sandra knows the situation is more dire than originally thought, and books Lars a flight out of Varna Airport for 4.20 p.m. later that day on July 8th. A couple of hours later, at around 5 a.m., Lars is spotted waving at a new cab driver on the side of the road. The driver picks Lars up and takes him to Varna Airport. The other female passenger in the cab reports Lars' pupils to be severely dilated. After arriving at the airport later that morning, Lars meets a man inside of the terminal who explains to him how to send and receive money through the Western Union banking system. Lars calls his mother again, careful not to burn through his cell phone's battery, and asked her to send him money via Western Union. Sandra is confused as neither she nor Lars has ever used it before, but she agrees to send him 500 euros per his request. Sandra also gives Lars the information regarding his flight that evening, but also asked him to check in with the airport's medical office to make sure he is safe to fly. 
In the event that the doctor suggests otherwise, Sandra also gives Lars the info for the bus tickets she bought him on the previous night as well. Lars makes a comment that they won't let him fly or drive and that he looks disheveled from hiding around earlier that night. Sandra suggests cleaning up in the bathroom and calling back when he has new information. A few minutes later, after setting up the Western Union transaction, Sandra calls Lars again, but after hearing only an unintelligible whisper from Lars, the call shuts off. This is the last point of contact Sandra makes with her son. She attempts to call again, but Lars never answers. At around 9 a.m., Lars finally makes it to the airport's medical clinic and meets with a Dr. Costow. Over the next 42 minutes, Dr. Casto studies Lars's passports, gives him medicinal eardrops, and clears him with a normal temperature of 37.2 degrees Celsius. Dr. Casto attempts to give him more pills as well, but Lars refuses. Regardless, Dr. Casto lets Lars know he is healthy enough to fly. He'll just need to sign a waiver. Lars signs this waiver and then asks to use the restroom, whispering under his breath about coming right back. It is at this time, around 10 a.m. on Monday, July 8, 2014, Lars bolts from the medical clinic, flees the terminal, and runs away from the airport. He climbs a fence, escapes into an adjacent meadow, and disappears into a sunflower field along Bulgarian Highway A2. This is the last confirmed sighting of Lars Mitank. Over the next couple of hours, Sandra Mitank attempts to locate her son. After losing all communication with him, she calls the honorary consulate in Varna and speaks to Ms. Mitrova at 11 a.m., informing her of the situation. An hour later, at 12 p.m., Ms. Mitrova returns Sandra's call and informs her of Lars' frantic escape from the airport. She says that Lars left all of his belongings behind and hasn't been seen since. The following day, on Tuesday, July 9th, a missing persons report is filed on behalf of Lars Mittank in Germany. The Wilmshaven Power Plant hires a private detective and lawyer based out of Varna. And the investigation into Lars' bizarre disappearance begins nearly seven years later, despite countless search and rescue operations and a few potential sightings, Lars Mittank is still missing. His family and friends scouring Europe for any remaining clues. Despite the time passed without any credible evidence coming to the surface. Not long after the missing persons report was filed, Bulgarian officials brought in Sandra Mitank to show her CCTV footage recorded at Varna Airport the morning Lars arrived and subsequently ran out just prior to vanishing. Some of these clips were eventually released to the public as well. As in all cases regarding missing people, security footage is our best tool to tracing their final steps and getting a best glance at their situation. However, these clips may also be distressing for some viewers and thus discretion is advised. We will show you the footage now. In the footage, we see Lars recorded walking through the airport terminal with his luggage under normal circumstances. He looks as if he's simply walking from point A to point B. However, after he looks over his shoulder and enters the CCTV's blind spot, the tape cuts to a later point in which Lars sprints back in the opposite direction without luggage and exits the terminal altogether. Then outdoor cameras capture Lars completely abandoning the airport property itself, supposedly scaling the fence. In these clips, we don't see anyone explicitly tailing or following Lars or really any suspicious figures at all. What Lars is running from isn't concrete, and the videos only add to the mystery. They do confirm that Lars was quite obviously troubled and whatever he was dealing with during those final few days in Varna wasn't just real, but very severe too. The only anomaly reported about the CCTV clips is that Sandra Mittank was actually shown different footage to what the public has access to. In the interviews following the investigation, Sandra told reporters that she saw additional security footage of Lars outside the airport. In these clips, one can see Lars navigate around two police cars as if he was avoiding capture. Sandra went on to say that judging from these clips, Lars was acting in a stable frame of mind and was operating with a plan. She said his actions were stealthy, moving behind buses and piles of sand before running towards the fence. Again, we do not have access to this portion of the CCTV files, but if Sandra and other investigators do have this information available to them, it does put a different perspective on Lars's activity. It does not answer the question why, but it does give us some information in a case with precious little. Now let's turn to the most prominent theories in answering the question of Lars Mittank's unsolved disappearance. When dissecting the strange case of Lars Mittank, many people wonder if Lars wasn't imagining the supposed men following him in the final hours of his movements around Varna, but that the four men who assaulted him on July 4th were indeed stalking him as he finished up his vacation. The big question, however, is why? 
Why would these men continue to follow Lars even after inflicting severe pain on him and letting him go? Some people wonder if Lars had actually escaped the initial first fight, had said something to the four gangsters as he ran off and thus coaxed them into further retribution. It would explain why Lars only had a ruptured eardrum and nothing more permanent. And also why he'd be worried about the four men finding him in the first place because he said something he regretted and felt like it put his life at even greater risk. The four men would have then eventually found him, waited for his friends to leave, and then followed him to the airport where they met him in the bathroom after his pre-flight checkup. At first, this may sound like a plausible theory, but it doesn't make much sense when you consider Lars' actions following the scuffle. He still went out with his friends the next couple of nights after July 4th and would have put himself in the public's eye where the gangsters could find him. Sure, maybe he felt protected in a group of people, but he would know that the gangsters could just follow him until he was alone. In addition, no one besides Lars ever reported seeing suspicious men follow him or around him after July 4th. In fact, even Lars himself was acting usual up until his friends flew back to Germany. Outside of not eating much, which can be linked to the incredible heat, Lars was being Lars. There was no reason to think he was being stalled by a nefarious crew of criminals. So if Lars wasn't running from a gang of hired Bulgarians, what could he have been paranoid about? There are those who believe Lars was actually in cahoots with a group of men or part of a larger criminal organization helping them to peddle drugs. It is possible that if Lars was dealing narcotics, it was against his own will and not necessarily by his design. These theories suggest that after Lars was roughed up by the four Bulgarians on the way back to the hotel on July 4th, they gave him a proposition, help them with their drug operation or suffer worse consequences than a busted eardrum. Not having much of a choice, Lars agreed to the deal and went back to Hotel Viva under the pretense that he had simply been beaten up a little by the Bulgarians after his confrontation at the Golden Sands Bar and that it was no big deal. This would explain why Lars was hesitant to go to the doctors as suggested by his girlfriend because he didn't want to alert anyone else of the situation or bring suspicion upon his motives. Lars then acted like his usual self for the remainder of the vacation and used his ear as an excuse not to travel home with his friends. It was after his friends left and he realized he was alone and stuck in a horrible situation that Lars felt overwhelmed. Hence the conversations with his mother on the phone and his paranoia regarding his credit cards. Maybe the night he was supposed to drop off the alleged narcotics was the night he spent at the Hotel Color and was captured by the Hotel CCTV meandering aimlessly in the lobby almost as if he were distressed. People also like to point out that Lars was using the same cab driver the night of July 7th and suggests that he had maybe been sent by the Bulgarians to escort Lars or keep an eye on him as he made the drop for whatever organization had threatened him. The most intriguing points to the drug cartel theory is the revelation made by reports of the airport CCTV footage capturing Lars avoiding detection by police as he disguised himself running away from the terminal. It's possible that the airport itself was a drop point. And after Lars fulfilled his part of the plan, he took off into the distance. Careful not to be arrested, fearful that he was a fugitive of the law. It would explain Lars's bizarre moves and give reason as to why someone would completely change their personality and behavior in the blink of an eye. However, if Lars did enter some sort of pact with Bulgarian drug peddlers, there isn't very much physical proof outside of circumstance. Lars's suitcase and luggage were recovered at Varna Airport and there were no illegal substances or any other drugs amongst his personal artifacts. Not only that, but the question must be asked. If Lars was forced to get involved with the drug trade at the request of a few street gangsters, why wouldn't he just tell the police? He'd have the busted Idromo's proof of coercion as well as witnesses who saw the confrontation with the Bavarian football fans at the Golden Sands Bar and heard their verbal threats about hiring muscle to assault Lars himself. It is not as if no one would believe him. The area he wound up in on July 7th was a poorer section of Varna and well known for both human trafficking and higher crime rates. It's within the realm of possibility that Lars ran into trouble but also totally plausible that law enforcement would be sympathetic to his situation and get him back to Germany safely. There are those who wonder if Lars wasn't threatened to do this but rather got in on a drug transaction for the money pretending not to want McDonald's on July 4th when in reality he was meeting up with people in a pre-planned event. The problem with this line of thinking is Lars had never engaged in criminal matters before and it seems unlikely he would put his steady job and flourishing relationship in jeopardy all for an incredibly risky crime hundreds of miles from home. Lars didn't know anyone in Varna nor did he speak either Bulgarian or Russian. 
He never showed signs of living a double life and breaking bad on a random summer night during a relaxing vacation doesn't make sense. So if Lars wasn't running from gangsters or involved in a drug ring, was there anyone else who could have been responsible for scaring Lars away? One suspect a few theorists have pointed out is the doctor who treated Lars at the Varna airport right before he disappeared. Dr. Kostow? Dr. Kostow changed his statements over the course of the initial investigation and made interesting claims about who exactly was in that examination room when Lars ran out. Kostow's first testimony claimed that a man in an airport uniform unexpectedly entered the office while Lars was being treated, which spooked Lars and led to his escape from the medical station. This man was described as an employee of the airline that Lars was using to fly home to Germany and was actually looking for Lars at that moment. The next statement Kosto gave mentioned an airport laborer walking into the examination room, not an airline employee. Finally, in the third claim, Kosto told investigators that he did not know who the intruder was and that he did not recognize him as either an airline employee or a separate worker. When investigators attempted to locate this man from the third statement, they were introduced to a man who was said to have been this mysterious figure. However, after exhaustive facts checking, it was learned by police that this man wasn't even in Bulgaria the day Lars disappeared, only clouding the entire airport predicament. Not only this, but there are holes in Dr. Casto's first two statements as well. Lars visited the airport medical site at around 9 a.m., but his flight wasn't scheduled until 4.20 and there were no travel alerts associated with that specific flight. So why would an airline representative be looking for a passenger so early? And how would they know Lars was with the doctor or the fact that he was even at the airport so early in the first place? Similarly, if the intruder wasn't an airline employee but rather a maintenance worker or other laborer for the airport, why would they just walk into an examination room unannounced? That would be a pretty large breach of privacy and very abnormal. If it was true, if someone did barge into the doctor's office while Lars was getting checked on, it's not out of the question that being in a vulnerable state of mind, Lars panicked and ran out thinking this intruder was out to get him. However, not even that scenario lines up with official reports. Remember, when Sandra called the honorary consulate, they told her that Lars had asked to use the restroom and Dr. Casto gave him permission, believing that Lars would return and collect his luggage. So in this scenario, there was no third man and Lars didn't make a run for it until he was out of the office. Who is telling the truth? Was Dr. Casto really involved? Authorities have ruled him out as a suspect and there doesn't seem to be any motive for him wanting Lars out of the story anyway. It just doesn't make sense as to why he would lie. Could it be an honest mistake? Absolutely. But that would be four separate misspoken testimonies. And that does lead one to see Dr. Casto in a suspicious light. Was he paid off to change his story? Well, it is unlikely, but plausible. Regardless, we'll never have definitive proof of exactly what happened in that examination room as airport CCTV cameras do not capture the entrance to the office space, making it a blind spot. Without a doubt, the most popular theories surrounding Lars Mittank's unselfed disappearance revolve around the idea that Lars suffered from an unfortunately timed mental health crisis or similar psychological break. Some people are quick to blame the medicine prescribed to Lars by the physician on July 7th, just after Lars checked out of Hotel Viva with his friends. The medicine in question, Cefbrazil, while a popular antibiotic in Bulgaria, is not as widely spread a drug in Germany. While it's highly effective against ear and other bodily infections, German health officials are wary of its possible side effects, including, but not limited to, hallucinations and potential drug-induced psychosis. It should be mentioned that these type of side effects are extraordinarily rare, basically never happening at all. But experts have warned that cefprozil, taken with other substances such as alcohol, can exacerbate the drug's various ill-fated effects. It is a known fact that Lars was drinking alcohol with his friends on the vacation prior to receiving the cefprozil. And it is possible he was taking other pills too, prescription nor recreational. Thus, Lars could have suffered a reaction to the Cefbrazil, the alcohol, or other drugs and fallen victim to the drug's powerful side effects. It is also important to recognize that Lars's dosage of Cefbrazil 500 mg was higher than most prescriptions of the same type and could also have played a role in creating a stronger reaction to the negative aspects of the antibiotic. Not only that, but it seems as if Lars himself was wary of the drug the night in which his paranoia began. He sent two texts to his mother, Sandra, asking her what, quote, Cefzil 500 was maybe as a reaction to feeling the strong antibiotics affecting him in an unsettling way. Not only that, but these side effects. 
in combination with being alone in a foreign country and after experiencing a potentially traumatic event at the hands of the Bulgarians could have tipped the scales and left Lars to deal with new anxieties, panic and hallucinations without the appropriate care to handle him. Spinning off this theory are questions of Lars' mental health in general and potential risk of developing schizophrenia. Lars' age at the time puts him right on the point of the demographic who are most likely to see an onset of schizophrenia prior to age 30. His symptoms also line up with those often seen in schizophrenia patients who are early on in their diagnosis, such as the feelings of being followed, losing control, imminent death, and of course, hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, and physical sensations that do not exist. Everything Lars had dealt with leading up to that moment could have triggered his own psychosis and thus left him afraid and paranoid. It should be stated, however, that no one in the Mitank family has ever displayed a history of schizophrenia, nor was Lars considered at risk by medical professionals back home. Lars did have somewhat a stressful life with his demanding job and his father's ailing health not helping matters. But again, there were no warning signs or previous diagnoses that affirmed the speculation that Lars was dealing with the onset of schizophrenia. So if it wasn't a mental disorder, could Lars have been dealing with a deeper physical issue than just a ruptured eardrum? Some theories detail a much more complex problem, figuring Lars to be suffering from repeated brain aneurysms, leading to retrograde amnesia and the inability to create new memories. This may explain why Lars seemed confused and at odds with everyone around him. He may have continually forgotten why he was where he was. This alone would spin anyone through cycles of emotional and psychological distress, potentially unlocking further panic and unrelenting terror. While a more severe brain injury is certainly in the cards, remember that Lars had been checked by three separate medical professionals, all of whom told him he was only suffering from the eardrum rupture. Maybe Lars was convinced there was something worse happening inside of his head, developing symptoms of hypochondria. And when the doctors continued to tell him no, he lashed out and ran away. Maybe this is why Lars had that awkward encounter with the ENT specialist at St. Anna's. And while he ran away from Dr. Castell, cause he believed he was dying but was being told he wasn't. Of course, this may have been an issue in of itself and not necessarily the effects of a traumatic brain injury. But it would explain the bouts of confusion. Also, it should be stated that Lars was lucid enough to call his mother multiple times, engage in conversation with others, navigate complicated bank transfers and credit card functions, and travel around Europe. So whatever he was dealing with, it wasn't 100% debilitating. If Lars was totally incapacitated, he wouldn't have slipped through the cracks so seamlessly. Despite the countless abnormalities surrounding Lars's case, there is still hope he is alive. While the summers in Varna, Bulgaria can get incredibly hot, Lars was an experienced outdoorsman and theoretically could have survived the elements. The fact he ran off without his belongings, his wallet, cell phone, and any other necessities do not increase his chances of survival, but certainly don't guarantee death. Like all major missing persons cases, there have been countless sightings of Lars made by the general public in the seven years since he vanished into the sunflower fields around Varna Airport. One truck driver saw a man eerily similar to Lars' physical description hitchhiking along a Varna highway about a year after he went missing. Another sighting alleged Lars was living as a homeless man in Poland while one person posted their supposed meetup with Lars in Canada on Reddit. Three years ago, while none of them have been confirmed, there was one testimony that led investigators to believe they had actually found Lars. In December of 2016, authorities in Porto Velho, Brazil, discovered a homeless man bearing a very strong likeness to Lars walking along a highway. The man was barefoot, disoriented, and disheveled. When police asked who he was, he was unable to remember where he came from or even what his own name was. He carried no identification and was confused as to how he got there. Law enforcement took him to a nearby hotel and a photo of the man sleeping circulated around the internet. Like police, people believed this man was Lars Mittank, thinking it was him hiding behind the massive beard and matted hair. Ultimately, authorities discovered this man was, in fact, not Lars, but another missing man, a Canadian humanitarian worker named Anton Pilipa, who had disappeared in 2011. While it didn't end up solving Lars' mystery, it did give hope to the fact that finding Lars alive and breathing is not out of the question. He'd probably be found in a similar state to Anton, confused and unaware of his situation. It's also proof that no matter how long we go between someone's disappearance and discovery, we cannot give up hope because unless evidence proves otherwise, they could still be out there, alive and desperate to return home. 
Stephen Mitchell Adams, known to his friends and family as a hardworking and persevering individual, was a kind and empathetic young man hailing from eastern Oklahoma. His deep-rooted interests in higher education and engineering, as well as his inclination to take care of his family and protect those he loved, was cut short by an unexplainable, unsolved disappearance. In the hilly woodlands of Toluca, Oklahoma, on December 13, 2004, leaving all who knew him across Cherokee Nation and the entire county at large, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As I hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Stephen Mitchell Adams and the troubling mystery near Tenkiller Lake. Stephen Mitchell Adams was born on August 4, 1978 to parents Carl Adams and Deanie Hayes near Weber Falls in Cherokee County, Oklahoma. Stephen was the third child becoming the youngest of three boys. His older brothers, Bradley and Chris, welcomed a younger brother with open arms and quickly fostered a healthy bond with the family's newest member. From birth, Deanie always spoke about Stephen's sweet brown eyes and his delicate love for everything and everyone he encountered. He was fascinated by people and displayed little shyness, smiling at strangers and rarely crying out. This bled into his childhood and adolescence when Stefan continued to live as a well-mannered boy, obedient, yet still his fun-loving, whimsical self. He knew how to make the people around him laugh. A natural class clown guaranteed to boost his classmates' spirits. His mother described him as a character never afraid to back down from a bit of weirdness to mellow out tense situations or simply just to make others feel at ease. People regularly told Stefan he would one day make a wonderful father, as well as just being a faithful friend. When Stefan and his brothers were still in grade school, the family did hit a bit of a rough patch after Carl and Deanie Adams got divorced and the family split up. Despite this fracture, however, the Adams clan remained tight-knit, strengthening their bonds even amidst the hardships. Stefan and his brothers continued to perform well in school, not letting the distractions of life take them down nefarious paths. As he neared the end of high school and the beginning of adulthood, Stefan realized he could continue his academic excellence and attend college, an opportunity not necessarily readily available to all of his classmates in Cherokee County. He researched as much as he could the programs that interested him and prepared tenfold for a post-graduation career in engineering, eyeing job opportunities in management sectors. He ultimately chose Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas to pursue his passion. Prior to completing his degree, though, Stefan's life would take a drastic twist in his late teenage years, delaying his move to university. You see, Stefan met fellow Telequa resident Alicia Renee Sizemore, and the two quickly entered a relationship. Before long, Alicia discovered she was expecting a baby girl and the couple married. They moved in with each other as Stefan worked a few jobs here and there, but nothing that set him on his career path. Eventually, their infant daughter was born, who they named Cheyenne, and Stefan and Alicia became full-time parents. Unfortunately, however, the stresses of parenthood at such a young age saw the once happy couple's relationship crumble behind closed doors. Stefan and Alicia would get into frequent arguments and soon recognized their marriage was untenable with a baby girl to attend to. The couple divorced at the turn of the millennium. However, Stefan's troubles were far from over. After the divorce and on two separate occasions, Stefan was falsely accused of child molestation by Alicia and her family. Both incidents led to Stefan being found not guilty and the charges were dismissed, but Stefan was still plagued by disagreements with his ex-wife. Even though they had sorted custody battles in court, Alicia would not allow Stefan to visit his daughter on his own time, forced supervised visitations as Alicia fought for sole custody and to completely remove Stefan from his daughter's life. Nevertheless, Stefan persisted. While managing custody issues, he moved in with a cousin of his nearby the Northeastern State University campus where Stefan had finally enrolled to take college courses. He was doing quite well despite the other stresses of his life. And he had a good part-time job at El Chico, a local Mexican restaurant. He had full support of his family behind him as the unfortunate disturbances shrouded his life and was able to start a much healthier relationship with his new girlfriend, Brianna Farr. It was looking like an uphill climb to fight for time with his daughter Cheyenne, but a climb Stefan was mentally and emotionally prepared to undertake. He had already made it so far in his young life and he'd be damned to let it all slip away. Tragically, however, despite Stefan's unshakable determination, his aim to build a better life for himself and his daughter was seemingly ended when, in the middle of December 2004, he vanished without a trace, bringing his fight for a career and a happy family to a screeching halt. 
Let's now turn to the timeline of events that led up to Stefan's unexplainable disappearance. The morning of Monday, December 13, 2004, begins like any other. Stefan Mitchell Adams awakes at his Telequa, Oklahoma apartment. He shares the modest living quarters with his cousin but keeps to himself most mornings. Stefan eats breakfast after sunrise and prepares for an important day. He has final exams for his autumnal semester at Northeastern State University later that day and is anxious to perform well. Stefan informs his roommate that he also has a shift at El Chico that evening and will visit his mother between class and work. He packs up a few books and school supplies, but leaves the majority of his possessions behind, not needing much for an exam across town. Stefan departs between 8 and 9 a.m. and heads towards Grand Avenue, where the NS Utiliqua campus resides. Between 9 and 10.30 a.m., Stefan takes his final exam at NSU. His classmates and professor alike confirm his attendance and report nothing out of the ordinary. At the same time, Stefan takes his test and from maybe as early as 7.50 that morning, eyewitnesses spot a man sitting in his truck at the Dollar General store located on East Downing Street in Tahlequah. This Dollar General is only a few blocks from Stefan's apartment and the man occasionally gets out of the car to walk around as if waiting for someone. One eyewitness asked the man what he's doing hanging around at the storefront, to which the man says he's a construction worker from Keys, Oklahoma, waiting for someone to pick him up. No one recognizes the man, and his activity is considered odd compared to the day-to-day -day traffic around the area. Back at the NSU campus at around 1.45 a.m., Stefan wraps up his exam and leaves his classroom. He hops into his white 1995 GMC Sierra single cab short bed truck with chrome bed rails, driving off NSU grounds and theoretically towards his mother's place in Weber Falls. Within the next 15 minutes, estimated to be around 11 a.m., the mysterious man at the Dollar General disappears and does not return. About seven minutes later, at 11.07 a.m., he picks up and the couple chats about Stefan's exam. He tells Brianna he thinks he fared well and is looking forward to wrapping up the semester. Stefan also informs Brianna that he is on his way to Weber Falls to visit his mother, Dini, but after he drives an unidentified man down to Keys. Stefan doesn't clarify if he knows the man or not, but Brianna hears a muffled voice in the background, assuming Stefan has already picked up whoever it is, most likely just a hitchhiker. Outside of this bizarre errand, Brianna claims Stefan sounds normal and in good spirits and doesn't think much else of it. This would be the last confirmed contact anyone has with Stefan Adams. At around 11.30 a.m., Stefan's cousin, who lived with him back at their apartment, tries calling Stefan's phone. The cell rings only twice before cutting to voicemail. Subsequent attempts to call Stefan's phone result only with voicemail options. From this point, his phone never rings again. Around the same time frame, between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m., Stefan is spotted by an eyewitness outside a convenience store in Cookston, Oklahoma, south of Keys. He is by himself, the supposed hitchhiker nowhere in sight. Stefan appears agitated or upset by something, a different demeanor than one heard by Brianna just a short time before. He reportedly gets back into his car and drives northbound along Highway 82, the opposite direction of Weber Falls. This is the last confirmed sighting of Stefan Mitchell Adams. Monday, December 13th wears on and Stefan never arrives at his mother's house in Weber Falls. Despite multiple calls by her and other family members, no one is able to reach him. At 5 p.m. that same day, Stefan fails to show up for his evening shift at El Chico. Neither Stefan's supervisor nor his co-workers hear from him. A strange anomaly at odds with his usual punctuality. Later that night, when Stefan never returned to his tailcore apartment complex, his family reaches out to the rest of their family and various friends to check to see if Stefan had taken shelter with any of them. Again, they are unable to find Stefan's whereabouts and go to bed fearful of his fate. The following day on Tuesday, December 14th, Stefan's supposed disappearance reaches a new severity when he fails to show up to class for another exam at NSU. This is the final straw for his family who know that Stefan would never jeopardize his future by skipping a final exam. They file an official missing persons report with the Telequa Police Department. Investigators immediately start seeking out the hitchhiker Stefan told Brianna he was driving to Keys the day before. They also put out a be alone notice for any 5'7 Native American men matching Stefan's description as well as his white GMC Sierra truck. Over the next few weeks, law enforcement canvasses the hills and various landscapes of Tahlequah, Oklahoma and its surrounding communities. 
When the holidays come and go without any sign of Stefan, detectives begin approaching the case as a homicide investigation. They base this conclusion on the fact that Stefan left all his personal belongings behind, including his two inhalers, which he needed due to a severe case of asthma. At the same time, police look at Stefan's ex-wife and her family as potential instigators. Stefan had been due in court for a custody hearing on December 21st in hopes of reversing the supervised visitation rule. But the timing of his disappearance seems like more than just a coincidence. They interview Alicia Sizemore and have her take a polygraph test. She technically fails, but as we know, polygraph tests are famously unreliable. And without any concrete evidence against her or her family, law enforcement let her go. Just after New Year's Day in January of 2005, Stefan Adams' family receives a vile phone call from an anonymous man who threatens to hurt the family if the investigation does not cease. Police are made aware of the call and the Adams' family goes on high alert. However, no physical damage is ever brought forth against them. In 2006, rescue groups team up with law enforcement agencies to search the waters of Ten Killer Lake, a large and deep body of water, located in the vicinity where Stefan was last spotted. The search only covers portions of the lake rather than its entirety, and nothing of note is found. These dives are paralleled with ground searches at the Fort Gibson historical site, but they all prove fruitless in the end. Across the next few years, investigators scour the rest of eastern Oklahoma for any vital clues, but come up empty-handed. They keep tabs on Stefan's social security number, bank accounts, credit cards, and phone service, but none are ever used or activated, dating back to December 13, 2004. The case is left cold until July of 2011, when Stefan's father, Carl Adams, submits a petition to impanel a grand jury to the district courts of Cherokee County asking for a special investigation into the disappearance of his son nearly seven years ago. The petition lists several factors contributing to the motion, including previously unheard statements that the man Stefan picked up at 11 a.m. on December 13 went by the name of Ronnie Meachling, who was tasked with delivering Stefan and his truck to multiple individuals. The petition claims that Meachling also wrote threatening letters from jail to Brianna Farr, Stefan's girlfriend at the time, demanding she keep her mouth shut about her missing boyfriend. The petition also claims that there are witnesses who saw Stefan beaten to death, that his disappearance was orchestrated by members of the Sizemore family, and the district attorney's office in Cherokee County refused to charge first-degree murder against any specific individuals or allowed the Adams family access to any investigative files or any pertinent information regarding the search for Stefan. The factual basis of these claims mentioned are neither confirmed nor denied, but the case is taken up by a grand jury nonetheless. Another five months pass by before the grand jury publishes their final report stemming from the special investigation on January 12, 2012. The report lists five major hypothetical conclusions in the overview of the grand jury's findings. The first being that they believe Stephen Adams is indeed a victim of homicide and that his body is located somewhere in eastern Oklahoma. Their second point states that Stephen's truck had been located parked, locked and abandoned by the Illinois River the day after his disappearance, but that it was subsequently ransacked of its belongings, including Stephen's NSU textbooks, which were sold back to the university, before the truck was stolen a second time. The report also clarifies that while there were certain individuals who had motives to kill Stephen Adams, they could not discern the exact cause of death, but they felt those responsible actually appeared before the grand jury in court. Most crucially, the overview states that they do believe the killers will be brought to justice and that those who clearly lied under oath during the grand jury testimonies should be investigated and properly prosecuted by then-District Attorney Brian Kuster. The grand jury concludes their report with optimism that their investigation and later findings will help aid the search for Stefan's body and bring his killers to justice. Over nine years later, however, and neither revelation has happened. The case is still open, but there are no updates, no clues and no promising leads as of the present day. Whilst discussing the timeline of Stefan Adams' disappearance, we mentioned a man spotted in the parking lot of a Dollar General store the morning of the ordeal. As random as it may have seemed, the Dollar Store situation may be connected to the case in more ways than one. In fact, investigators have pleaded with the public to keep an eye out for the man who was seen there, who authorities aren't calling a suspect but a person of interest. They believe he may have vital information to either the location of Stefan's body or could at least provide a better idea of what happened to him that chilly winter's day. 
The dollar store man is our major case point, seemingly at the center of this mystery. When the unidentified man was first sought out by law enforcement, a sketch was released along with a detailed description, built from multiple testimonies of people who shopped at the Dollar General that morning. He was described as a Caucasian male in his 40s or 50s, standing at around 5 foot 11 inches and weighing approximately 190 pounds. He was thought to have had either brown or salt and pepper colored hair obscured beneath a dark green stocking cap or beanie. Some people also mentioned that the man had a beard and a mustache of about four to five days worth of facial hair growth. However, this wasn't a unanimous testimony. Along with the green cap, the man also wore dark blue or black faded jeans, a tan colored car hat jacket over a flannel shirt and wore eyeglasses. His vehicle was estimated to be a black or other dark-colored 2000 Ford Ranger pickup truck fashioned with a silver toolbox in the bed. He never gave his name, only his destination. And a basic reason as to why he was hanging around for such a long time. There are a few reasons why this is pertinent to Stefan's case. The first is the general strangeness of the predicament. Locals were quick to pinpoint the bizarre nature of the man's situation. There aren't a lot of middle-aged men sitting in parking lots of dollar stores waiting for rise to cities just a few miles away, especially before 8 in the morning in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The second is the location of the man. The Dollar General in question is found right next to Stefan's apartment complex in the 400 block of East Downing Street, less than a minute's walk away. Not only that, but police reports from the morning also detail another sighting of a, quote, suspicious man snooping around Stefan's apartment the morning he went missing. It was never confirmed that the Dollar General man was also the man at the apartment complex, but the fact that the area had two strange interactions with an unidentified male at the same time make it truly baffling. The third reason this connects to Stefan's case is the timing of it all. Along with the parallel suspicious sightings, the Dollar General man timed his stakeout at the store to coincide with Stefan's departure from his home and his time spent at NSU campus. The Dollar General man also left the shop at the exact same time Stefan left class and right before Stefan theoretically picked up the hitchhiker, later reported to be Ronnie Meachling. It was never clarified if Ronnie Meachling was the Dollar General man, but considering the police are still looking for the man in the sketch, it is safe to assume they are two different people. So could this all just be a coincidence? Of course, there is nothing criminal about waiting in a parking lot for someone to give you a lift. However, when you start to list all the coincidences, it becomes too much to ignore. The Dollar General man was near Stefan's apartment on the morning he went missing and never returned. He also told people he was heading to Keys, Oklahoma, the exact location where Ronnie Meachling or whoever the hitchhiker was told Stefan they were going. Is it possible? The Dollar General man was working in tandem with others in an abduction operation. At the very least, it cannot be ruled out. He could have been watching Stefan the morning of the 13th and waited for him to leave for his exams. Then when 11 a.m. arrived and Stefan never returned, he knew that Stefan had been kidnapped and at that point left the scene. Again, however, it is also possible that the Dollar General man is truly just a person of interest and had no involvement with the disappearance. Maybe the man is sought out by police because he had the best vantage point of Stefan's apartment the day he went missing and thus could be the only eyewitness to be able to describe the other male who was seen snooping around that morning. It is impossible to label the Dollar General man's exact involvement, but considering the circumstantial oddities and overall suspicious nature of his activity, it is vital we find the man in the dark green stocking cap to take that next step in this investigation. Let's now turn to the most prominent theories surrounding the disappearance of Stephen Mitchell Adams. One of the earliest theories surrounding Stefan's disappearance involved an accidental death. Theories that included no third parties or alleged killers responsible for the man's fate. Instead, these theories suggested Stefan ran his truck off a road on his way down Highway 82 towards Weber Falls to see his mother. These theories posits that Stefan drove the hitchhiker down to Keys and dropped him off without a hitch than somewhere on his journey. His truck may have started causing problems or broken down to a degree where it was still drivable but not necessarily safe to do so. This could have been when Stefan pulled over at a convenience store near Cookston where a passerby alleged they spotted Stefan acting flustered or in some sort of emotional distress. Maybe Stefan was upset about his truck, worried about having one more thing break down or go wrong when so much in his life was volatile at the time. And then after deciding to turn around because of his truck's troubles, he broke down again, but this time on one of the winding roads through the surrounding foothills. 
If this was the case and Stefan lost control of his truck and sped off the road, it is highly possible he drove into a ravine or steep drop-off that concealed his destroyed car and even worse, Stefan's injured body. When people think of Oklahoma, they usually imagine the flat plains and open pastures of prairie grass and farmlands. However, it should be noted that eastern Oklahoma is a more mountainous region of the state, featuring uneven terrain that could definitely contribute to such a scenario. Stefan was driving a 10-year-old truck at the time, so a random breakdown during a routine trip isn't out of the ordinary or unexpected. It also would explain why Stefan was heading northbound after he left the convenience store in Cookston when Weber Falls is in the opposite direction. If he felt more comfortable just heading back to Taliqua where a trusted mechanic could look things over for him, he may have simply decided to postpone his visit with his mother. All that being said, there are too many holes in the accidental death theory to be ignored. If Stefan was having car troubles and needed immediate help, why wouldn't he just call someone? He owned a cell phone and could have called a local mechanic or a friend to pick him up. On a similar note, if the car troubles were enough to disrupt his plans with his mother, why wouldn't he call her to let her know what was happening? Remember, at the same time Stefan was seen at the convenience store, his cousin was attempting to call him but only reached voicemail. Now certainly, Stefan was agitated at that point and may not have been in the best of moods to talk. But if he was in a bind with his truck, it surely would make sense that Stefan would at least answer his cousin's call and explain what was happening. On a larger scale, the accidental death theory doesn't make sense ultimately because of the fact that the truck was never found to begin with. Had Stefan driven off the road, he couldn't have gone very far after that. Even traveling at high speeds down Interstate 82, the trees and inclines surrounding the highway would have slowed his vehicle enough so that it wouldn't completely vanish into the woods. These lands were scoured by search and rescue teams and investigators, especially Highway 82. A large white truck would have been found. And if a random passerby found the total truck before police, they would have reported it, seeing as though Stefan's body would be inside. An entire pickup truck doesn't evaporate into thin air. And unless Stefan drove his broken truck deep into the wilderness after crashing it through a horrific injury, there is simply no reason why it wouldn't be found. Spinning on from these theories came another hypothesis that if Stefan didn't drive off the road by accident, he did it on purpose. Some believe that the life circumstances around Stefan had become too intense and led to a breakdown, which tragically then led to a suicide attempt. These theorists believe Stefan left his apartment that morning with the idea he would not return, explaining that was the reason he left behind all of his personal belongings, including his life-saving inhalers for his asthma condition. They continue, saying Stefan camouflaged his day to appear normal with final exams and a trip to his mother's house. When his girlfriend called after class, Stefan again hid his true intentions, presenting himself to be in good spirits. Then, he used the story about a hitchhiker to cover up his plans, giving himself an alibi, so to speak. This would explain why Stefan was then seen alone and upset at the convenience store. He had never actually picked anyone up and was struggling to cope with what he was about to do. The theories then speculate this is why Stefan's cell phone was ignored and eventually shut off. From here, there are dozens of sub-theories, with some suggesting Stefan drove into the nearby Ten Killer Lake on purpose. Others posit that Stefan drove off somewhere he knew he'd never be found to end his own life on his terms away from where his family could find him. However, we must follow up this theory with the fact that nearly every professional investigator associated with the case, including Stefan's family and closest friends, have rejected the idea that Stefan committed suicide. Too many people attempt to decipher one's mental state as being fragile and immediately label a disappearance as suicide. Yes, Stefan was going through immense difficulties and fighting to see his own child, but he was also determined and strong-willed and had already overcome so much. In short, he had hoped that his situation was ready to change, with a custody hearing to reverse supervised visitation in a mere nine days. To speculate without any concrete evidence that he killed himself simply because his current situation wasn't the smoothest of rides is an insult to his memory, especially when there are many other factors to suggest suicide is not the cause of death. Most contradictory of all is the fact that there were numerous purported threats against Stefan's family and his girlfriend. If Stefan had ended his own life, why would people who had a vendetta against him scare his living family members and threaten them with violence if the investigation wasn't halted? If Stefan's enemies saw that he had disappeared and they had nothing to do with it, why would they try and stop investigators from figuring out what exactly did happen? That would absolve them of any wrongdoing and that have nothing to worry about. 
Plus, there have been countless private detectives, law enforcement officials, and an entire grand jury who have all ruled Stefan's case to be that of a homicide. So it is reasonable to assume there may be yet more information that might not be available to the public that points directly to murder. It also makes little sense that all the bizarre behavior would take place within the same few hours on the same day Stefan vanished too. The suspicious sightings, the hitchhiker, the cell phone, Stefan's behavior at the convenience store. It all adds up to something more than a mere suicide attempt. So if Stefan was murdered, the question is, who could have done it? The idea of a serial killer doesn't really get tossed around much in Stefan's case, and it makes sense. There were zero known or unidentified serial murderers in the Tahlequah, Oklahoma area in the early 2000s or really the surrounding areas for much of that time frame and location. Our research did show there were a couple of criminals and small-scale killers around eastern Oklahoma in December of 2004 but almost all of them involved specific motives or victims not of Stefan's demographic or were obvious instances of the killer knowing their victim and not just a random murder as is too often seen in serial homicides. In fact, it's that exact type of crime, a killer killing because of a personal relationship with the victim that fits Stefan's case file best. As previously mentioned, Stefan did have a group of people who did not want him alive. And theorists believe it was this collection of characters who conspired to and ultimately did kidnap him. Remember, Stefan's ex-wife Alicia accused him not just once but twice of child molestation against their young daughter, Cheyenne. Both times the accusations were dismissed in court and Stefan was found not guilty. But that didn't stop the rest of Alicia's family from taking out their anger on Stefan himself. Deanie Hayes, Stefan's mother, told police after his disappearance that at some point between Stefan going missing and the court cases, Alicia's father threatened to kill him personally. Stefan never appeared too distraught or intimidated by the threats and never instigated any violence against the Sizemore family to protect his future with his daughter. Yet that didn't stop them from verbally abusing Stefan or stop Alicia from going out of her way to stop Cheyenne seeing her father. So beyond a clear motivation, what else could point to the Sizemores being responsible? Well, theorists are quick to point out that the last sighting of Stefan at the convenience store in Cookson was actually reported by a semi-distant relative of Alicia's. The woman who told authorities about Stefan's agitated demeanor and northbound departure in the wrong direction was Alicia's mother's brother's sister-in-law, or in simpler terms, the sister of Alicia's aunt-in-law. Now it's easy to understand how this might sound convoluted and somewhat irrelevant. Small towns across America are known for large interconnected families, where scratch anyone and their kin to anyone else. Yet it has led some to wonder if this eyewitness was a part of the Sizemore family that held disdain for Stefan, could they have made up the sighting to throw off police? Maybe this person did see Stefan at a convenience store, but lied about him being alone to give the hitchhiker or Ronnie Meachling an alibi or at least absolve them of any wrongdoing. Or maybe this eyewitness lied about the direction in which Stefan drove so that detectives would look in the wrong places for his body or his truck and at least slow down the investigation. However, it is still entirely plausible that even if the witness was giving a false statement to aid her extended family, parts of the sighting remain true. The part which makes the most sense is Stefan's odd behavior. His obvious discomfort and agitation for telling what was about to happen, whether he knew outright what it was or not. Again, it must be stated that just because this eyewitness had a relation to Alicia and her family does not mean she was lying or covering up a murder. That is an extremely heavy accusation to make with pretty much no evidence other than a rough, distant relation to someone we know wanted Stefan out of the picture. Also, if the Sizemores included a relative so far down the family tree in their scheme, that would most likely mean there were plenty of others in the family who knew of their dastardly plot too. Maybe the eyewitness was closer to Alicia than just being her mother's brother's sister-in-law, but there is still an enormous amount of doubt surrounding her potential role in a murder conspiracy. Could she be one of the people who lied under oath during the grand jury inquiry in 2011? That too is a distinct possibility. Aside from the convenience store witness, the other suspects in the investigation aren't as clear-cut as to what they mean regarding Stefan's fate. It's still unknown whether or not the Dollar General man was ever located. And if so, what detectives learned about his time spent in Talakoa on December 13th. It's also still unknown how Ronnie Meachling, the supposed hitchhiker, fits into the investigation. The man wasn't identified until Carl Adams, Stefan's father, listed his name in the petition for the grand jury in 2011 and claimed that Ronnie told people his role in the disappearance was to hitch a ride with Stefan and then, quote, deliver him and his truck to another group of individuals. 
Who these people were has also never been clarified. Brianna Farr told police she received a letter from Ronnie from jail though advising her to back off from the case, but it also hasn't been made public why Ronnie was in jail in the first place. Was it for his connection to Stefan's disappearance or a completely separate issue? We have searched for Ronnie tirelessly across the internet and databases but found zero matches. Could it be his name was misspelled in a court report? Could it be that Ronnie Meachling is an alias for someone else? And on that subject, is Ronnie Meachling also the Dollar General Man? They never appear in the same vicinity together in the story and the Dollar General Man's movements align perfectly with Ronnie's entrance into the scenario. Again, these answers have not been provided by investigators. Maybe they think that by releasing Ronnie's full profile, it will hamper their investigation. But from our perspective, the official investigation has been stalled for nine years now. And the haze surrounding Ronnie Meachling makes it very hard to get a full grasp on the case at large. Technical details aside, theorists who believe Stefan was kidnapped and murdered by someone associated with Alicia and her family tied it all together like this. Stefan was supposed to be kidnapped at an earlier date, like the grand jury reported, but those plans fell through and they were redirected for December 13, 2004. A man, either part of the Sizemore family or paid by them, later known as the Dollar General Man, is recruited to spy on Stefan's apartment that morning. He arrives at the Dollar General at around 7.50 a.m. and begins to stake out the area, waiting for Stefan to leave. During his time spent in the parking lot, he also wanders over to the apartment complex himself and snoops around, making him the man who was later reported to have been spotted near Stefan's home that morning. Then, when Stefan left for class, the Dollar General man stayed put, making sure. Stefan did not return home earlier than expected. At 11 a.m., once it was confirmed the coast was clear, the Dollar General man left, his job done. This is where Ronnie, or the hitchhiker, as we'll call him, enters the plot. On Stefan's route home, possibly where Stefan parked his car on NSU's campus, the hitchhiker introduces himself to Stefan and asks for a ride to Keys. Knowing Keys is on his way to Weber Falls, Stefan agrees and calls his girlfriend. When Stefan tells Brianna everything is okay and hangs up the phone, the hitchhiker probably asks to use the phone himself. This is where the hitchhiker most likely calls the people he is delivering Stefan to. The hitchhiker then holds onto the phone after he is done. And when Stefan's cousin attempts to call, the hitchhiker either turns the phone off or destroys it using a gun or other means to hold up Stefan. The hitchhiker has Stefan drive off into an unknown part of town or secluded location where they are then intercepted by others who take Stefan's truck, kill him and dispose of his body. They dump the body somewhere in the eastern Oklahoma wilderness and drive the truck to the banks of the Illinois River where it is ransacked and stolen the following day. Everyone involved gets out clean and the police are left with a massive case void of clues. In this theory, the sighting at the convenience store is considered a red herring fabricated by those responsible. To date, this is perhaps the most plausible theory drawn up by investigators. It includes crystal clear motive, suspicious characters, and fits the timeline of events. It may seem a stretch to believe that a little family in a little town in Oklahoma could concoct such a horrific scheme and also get away with it. But remember, the grand jury themselves said they felt like they knew who killed Stefan and those responsible had testified before the courts. This was almost certainly referencing the Sizemore family since they were known to be involved with the hearings. At this point, it comes down to physical evidence being procured by cold case detectives and or combined with an admission by a member of the family or guilty party. Until that happens, this remains just another theory like all the others regardless of how well the pieces seem to fit the puzzle. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Stefan Mitchell Adams' unsolved disappearance, we want to make known that our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each episode, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In Stefan's case, we find it relatively obvious how Stefan disappeared via kidnapping and then most likely murder. There are too many factors to suggest Stefan ended up the victim of foul play, let alone the numerous conclusions reached by professional investigators and the Cherokee County Grand Jury. Frustratingly, they reveal a lot about the case while simultaneously not revealing much at all, at least in terms of specifics. But they do lead us to believe police have their prime suspects lined up in sight and are just waiting for the physical evidence to surface so irreversible arrests can be made. 
Who those suspects are is easy to define and is definitely the people who called to threaten Stefan's family, both before and after he vanished. Sometimes it is all too easy to get lost in cold cases and try and link victims with far-fetched narratives about random killings. But when there is a clear-cut motivating factor behind people connected with Stefan, it is logical to assume they are the guilty party. Of course, they are innocent until proven guilty, but in terms of building a hypothesis, the people who literally called for Stefan to die prior to him going missing are most likely the ones who did it. So if they did, how was it done? The final theory we mentioned in the previous segment sums it up best as we believe the Dollar General man was staking out Stefan's apartment and complicit in the crime whether or not he was the actual killer. We believe Stefan did indeed pick someone up after finishing his exam. And even if the man's name wasn't Ronnie Meachling, or if Ronnie Meachling doesn't actually exist, we believe they held Stefan at gunpoint and directed him towards his fate. Then after the murder, they disposed of his body in a place no one will ever find and dumped the white GMC pickup truck near the Illinois River, per the grand jury's findings. We wish investigators would continue looking for the people who looted the truck and resold Stefan's textbooks back to Northeastern State University because they too could hold vital information regarding evidence left behind. The killer could have left DNA and fingerprints in the truck. And while those have most likely been lost to time over the last 16 years, there is always a chance and chances are worth clinging to. In times of desperation. Thus, we ask that anyone with any sliver of information related to Stefan's disappearance, his truck's disappearance, or the situation at large, to please call the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation at 805-228017. We also want to take a quick moment and acknowledge the complicated issue regarding the accusations of child molo station against Stefan. We do not want to minimize these types of accusations, but rather clarify we are simply reporting what was found by two separate courts in the matters. Each accusation was dismissed in court and heavily refuted by both Stefan and his family. Therefore, that is how we present the research. Tragically and far too often, ideas that women lie or fabricate their stories about neglect, abuse, and rape are shared and believed. These are incredibly serious topics and are very real and never to be minimized. Also, just because someone's case is dismissed by a judge does not mean they didn't do something. And that is why every instance is unique and should be handled with care and respect, no matter how you feel about the accuser. However, in the end, cold-blooded murder is never justified. And Stephen Mitchell Adams did not deserve to leave Earth so soon and without a trace. He was a hard-working young man who fought tooth and nail to provide for his family. He was a free-spirited presence who loved to laugh and, more importantly, entice others to join him in the laughter. Stefan was well on his way to management within the engineering sector and would have made a wonderful leader among his peers. Needless to say, he had a bright future, a future cut to darkness far too soon. His family does not deserve to dwell in that darkness any longer. Therefore, it's up to us to rekindle the fire that will light the way towards his discovery, illuminating the mystery of Stephen Mitchell Adams and his final drive through the foothills of the Ozark. Amber Alyssa Tucaro was a fiercely courageous, confident, and compassionate young woman beloved by her friends and family, her deep-rooted connection with cultivating relationships, as well as her passion to nurture those in need and make a positive impact on the world around her was cut short by an unexplainable, unselfed death in the dog days of summer, 2010. She left all who knew her in the Miccosukee Cree First Nation in Alberta, Canada, and the entire country at large, devastated, bewildered, and horrified in the wake of her tragic murder. In the hope of providing a more substantial reasoning based upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the death of Amber Takaro and the suspicious audio recording from Amber's final phone call that may provide a clue to identify her unknown killer. Amber Alyssa Tukro was born on January 3, 1990 as a part of the Minishu First Nation crew, an indigenous First Nations government of Woodland Cree people in northeastern Alberta, Canada. Three days after her birth, she was adopted by the Tukro family, led by her soon-to-be mother, Vivian Tutsi Tukro. She joined a family of all-male children. Tutsi and her husband at the time had always wanted a baby girl of their own and looked into adoptions as a solution. Thus, when they received a call about an opportunity to adopt, Amber was happily introduced to the Takaro clan and was instantly loved by each member of the family. Growing up, Amber wasted no time forging a close relationship with her parents and brothers, Paul, Billy Joe, Conrad, and Justin. 
Together, the Takoro siblings grew up in Fort Chippewyan as a part of the Minishu First Nation Crew Reserve, which was signed to the indigenous tribe in a treaty with Canada in 1986. Paul Takoros and his brothers took special care in looking after Amber, later saying that she was coddled, but she also picked up on vital parts of living quite early, learning how to walk at the surprising age of only eight months. This solidified a resounding resilience in Amber who hardened into a fiercely independent and resourceful young woman. Paul later said at the MMIW National Inquiry revolving around Amber's death that she was the family's pride and joy and had a special place in Tootsie's heart as the daughter she never thought she'd have. A few years later into Amber's life, Tootsie and her then-husband filed for divorce. While it was originally planned to split up the family with the siblings breaking up into two residencies with each parent, it ultimately left Tootsie with all of her children. However, like many broken marriages, the divorce left Paul and his brothers to take leadership roles within the family, continuing to look after Amber and their mother. The brothers shared cooking and cleaning duties whilst all the siblings attended Athabasca Delta Community Schools. As a teenager, Amber struggled with staying motivated to continue school in the reservation education system, but kept at it after the prodding of her older brothers, who constantly preached how important education was for a family who lacked it in generations prior. Once the brothers grew older and started miniature families themselves, Amber played a vital role in fostering relationships with her sisters-in-law, nieces, and nephews. One of the many interests she developed over the years was a fascination with music and would introduce an eclectic variation of songs to her younger family members she looked after, much like her brothers did for her. She grew incredibly proud of her nieces and nephews and infected them with her happy-go-lucky spirits whenever she visited. In June of 2009, Amber had a child of her own, giving birth to a son named Jacob. Jacob became Amber's everything, and she cared for him deeply. The two went everywhere together, even on trips outside Fort McMurray where she last lived. Tootsie Tukoro often warned Amber of the dangers of such adventures, but Amber's forwardness and hard-headed spirit persisted. She was never afraid to get her hands dirty and always stuck up for herself and her loved ones. Sadly, however, the last trip the mother and son duo ever ventured on would prove to be fatal. When on the night of August 18, 2010, Amber last made contact with her Tukaru family and then disappeared into the calm countryside of Edmonton, the site where her homicide investigation would break out two years later, when it was discovered that it was here that she drew her last breaths in Letta County. Let's turn now to a timeline of the events leading up to Amber's death. Twenty years between the 1990s and the end of the noughties, Tutsi Takaro looks out for her daughter, Amber Takaro, like a hawk, always preaching common sense, safety, and daily precaution as any mother will. These tips included warnings of staying away from strangers and getting into cars with unknown men. It fastens an important bond between her and her only female child. Fast forward to 2010. And Amber blossoms into an independent and lively soul, starting a family with her own newborn son, Jacob and surrounding herself with devoted friends. She develops an explorative soul and a curiosity that inspires her to take trips around Canada and check out the various cities and cultures outside of her hometown lands. Later that same summer, in August of 2010, Amber decides to plan a trip to Edmonton to visit a friend. She invites another one of her unidentified friends to join her and her 14-month-old son aiming to leave in the middle of the month for a two-day excursion. Soon after the plans are forged, Amber informs her mother of the short Edmonton vacation. Tutsi immediately feels uneasy about the idea and tells her daughter she shouldn't go, hearkening back to her safety standards of adolescence. Amber's independent and forward spirit holds true, however, and she keeps the plans intact. On Tuesday, August 17th, Amber packs up a few essentials and heads to the airport with Jacob and her friend and flies from Fort McMurray to Edmonton International Airport. Later on the 17th, the young trio arrives just outside of the city near the airport and checks into the Nisku Place Motel for lodging. During their stay at the motel, Amber stays in constant communication with her mother, sending along texts and updates throughout the afternoon. On day two of the trip, Wednesday, August 18th, Amber agrees with her friend that they will travel into the city the following day. Their funds are not large and they plot ways to save money during the trip. As the evening draws near on the 18th, Amber decides she wants to head into Edmonton earlier than they planned. Being low on cash, she makes unknown arrangements for a ride into the city and leaves Jacob with her friends at the Nisku Motel. Without divulging any specifics of the ride or details about who is picking her up, Amber leaves for a hitchhike in the stranger's vehicle. 
This will be the last confirmed time anyone sees Amber Takaro. During Amber's ride with her mysterious driver, she receives a phone call from her brother in the Edmonton Remand Center, a local prison system. The entire conversation lasts 17 minutes and includes multiple instances of Amber questioning her driver, of their intended destination to which he replies with suspicious and strange answers. The call ends without notice and would be the last confirmed time anyone talked to or heard from Amber Takaro. As we fall deeper into the night of August 18th, both Amber's friend and Tutsi Takaro lose all contact with Amber, who no longer responds to texts or phone calls. Tutsi immediately feels intense worry. Remembering her daughter's hard-headedness to all of her warnings about the mischievous characters of the world, knowing her daughter's silence is too abnormal for comfort, Tutsi calls the authorities and reports Amber missing. After the Royal Canadian Mounted Police receives the missing person's reports, they tell Tutsi the case is not of any serious importance. Their excuse is that Amber is probably out partying and snuck away for recreation and will call later that night or the next day. 24 hours go by and Amber remains silent. Tutsi pushes the missing person's reports and the RCMP finally takes initiative to investigate. Over the next 14 months, the RCMP interviews people both familiar with Amber and folks around Edmonton's outskirts. They develop few leads and find little to no evidence around Nisku. In October of 2011, the RCMP officially asks for investigative assistance from Project Care, a special task force that focuses on missing and murdered women's cases. Yet, it wouldn't be for another 10 months before the next big development explodes in Amber's vanishing. In August of 2012, police obtain a 17-minute phone call recording from the Edmonton Romance Center featuring Amber Takaro's voice. Amber appears to be in a car with an unidentified male. Authorities confirm the legitimacy of the audio clip and theorize the mysterious man in question is almost certainly involved with Amber's vanishing. By the end of the month, on Tuesday, August 28th, Project Care and the RCMP released the phone recording to news outlets who broadcast a one-minute excerpt to a national audience, asking citizens around the country if they can recognize or identify the unknown male's voice. Hundreds of tips pour in from concerned listeners. In a major coincidental twist, on Saturday, September 1st, 2012, a mere four days after the clip is released, a group of horseback riders stumble upon a fragment of human skull in a wooded area on rural farmland near Leduck in Leduck County, south of Edmonton. The bones are quickly sent for processing and dental records confirm they match Amber Takaro's DNA profile. Her case transitions from missing persons to an unsolved homicide. In the following weeks, months, and years, investigators continue their pleas for the general public to come forward with information about the male voice in Amber's final phone call, now understanding him to likely be her killer. Plenty of followers report potential persons of interest, but none are ever announced to the public or arrested. The most curious circumstance of all is a time when three separate women who wish to remain anonymous come forward to the police and say for certain they know who the voice belongs to. However, this man is apparently heavily searched and interrogated by investigators and cleared of having any connection to Amber. Sadly, from 2012 to the present day, Amber's unsolved death has only grown colder. The male voice has yet to be identified and the longer it freezes, the more forgotten it becomes by society. The most recent update came on January 24, 2020 when a young man from Edmonton called the RCMP and stated he believed his father was not only the male driver in Amber's case but also responsible for the deaths of other murdered women. In the Leduc County area, the RCMP investigated the claim but found it to be unsubstantiated. They said the claimant had a history of reporting fabricated tips and that some of the murdered women's cases he said his father had involvement with were already solved. As of today, both the RCMP and Project Care investigators are still asking for people to call in with any leads to identifying the unknown man or solving Amber's homicide case in general. Of all the odd peculiarities prodding out of Amber's case file, none cuts deeper than the mysterious phone call recording obtained by police and major news outlets two years after Amber Takaro's initial disappearance. While the exact time of the phone call has never been specified, it's collectively agreed upon to be the last communication Amber made with any of her family or friends and the final clue she left behind before she was ultimately killed. Thus, it's believed the phone call recording took place originally on August 18, 2010, the day Amber vanished and passed away. 
It happened in the later evening hours when Amber decided to leave her son with her friend and travel into Edmonton that night rather than the following day. To save money for lodging, Amber decided to forego a taxi or paid car service and hitchhiked with a stranger. During the ride with the unidentified man, Amber entered a telephoned conversation with her brother who made a phone call from prison at Edmonton's remand center where all outgoing communication is recorded and preserved. The entire talk is 17 minutes long, but only about one minute was released by authorities claiming it's the only vital piece of information relevant to Amber's death. The ending of the clip is not the ending of this conversation. However, in an interview with Tutsi Takuro, CBC News reported that Tutsi had heard the entire recording and said it ended abruptly, detecting fear in Amber's voice. But as I'm sure you noticed, even within the one minute we have available, there is a level of discomfort emanating from Amber's question. While she holds firm on her desires and remains vocal, there is a sense of unease. The unknown man is clearly lying with Amber. At first saying they're heading south or north of Beaumont. Later in the recording, he says he's taking her to 50th Street. However, locals of Edmonton claim there are no gravel roads on 50th Street and that he was most likely driving down countryside roads in the complete opposite direction. The suspect also sounds as if he laughs at one point in the clip, hinting at a potentially deranged motive. Regardless, it's obviously painful to hear Amber's final words confessing her concern with the man taking her someplace she doesn't want to go. It's highly probable that the man in this recording is the man who took Amber's life, or at least he was one of the final people to make contact with her and absolutely knows of her fate. Hundreds of people have called into the RCMP over the years with tips and names of possible suitors. Yet investigators have never confirmed or released a name, rather explaining that they've researched all leads and have yet to find someone who fits the man's profile. Without a doubt, someone out there has also heard this male subject's voice before and could come forward with absolutely vital information. If you or anyone you know might be able to identify the voice heard in Amber Takaro's final phone call, please alert the proper authorities. Although audio from telephones and secondary recordings can distort a person's voice, identifying the man behind this audio clip will likely be the information needed to finally crack Amber's case. Bringing a family in mourning much deserved closure and bringing justice to light against a killer. In the years since Amber Tukro's murder, plenty of theories have been constructed by her family, by Edmonton residents, and concerned followers of the case all across Canada. Most often they revolve around the tragic audio recording of Amber's haunting final phone call and pinpointing the identity of the man behind the wheel, driving her towards doom. One popular theory attempting to identify Amber's killer derives from three women who called in with testimonies about who the male voice belongs to in Amber's phone recording. Soon after it was released in 2012, the first woman who alerted authorities claimed she was certain she knew who the voice was, saying she was able to perfectly picture him in the scene of Amber's final moments. The name of this male individual was not released to the public, but soon after, two new women followed up the report with additional claims that they believed the voice to be of the same male individual. Three random incidents of three separate women. Or reporting the same person rings highly suspicious. The RCMP thought so too, but has since announced that the male individual has no connection to Amber or her final days in Edmonton. And yet those unidentified women believed the claims against the man were not investigated thoroughly. After some digging by curious third parties across the internet, it was discovered that the person in question reported by the three women was a man by the name of Pat Carson. Pat Carson is an infamous figure of the Edmonton, Canada area, known for his criminal record and arrests for sexual assault, procuring juvenile prostitutes, and physically assaulting a woman by choking her to overcome her resistance. He was released from prison on January 28, 2003, and returned home to his horse ranch in Sandy Beach, Alberta. Ever since, he has been residing there, working around his land and fixing machinery while also posting advertisements across Craigslist and other internet forums for people to come and work on his ranch as apprentices. This is where things become murky and disturbing. Since being released from prison, countless stories of Pat and his horse ranch have populated blogs and Reddit threads online discussing his severely suspicious activity and history of disturbing behavior. In fact, there is an entire website dedicated solely to warning young people and anyone who comes into contact with his job postings, allowing people to share their stories of horror in regards to both Pat himself and the ranch. Multiple people talk about how manipulative he was over the phone and in person, talking about taking naked photos for wood carvings to generate revenue. 
One detailed story from a woman who visited the ranch in the mid-2000s repeated similar circumstances and how Pat would use alter egos and ask for full body massages. The same victim went on, saying how she realized she wasn't safe at his ranch and telling of how she once went through his things one night when he wasn't home and found he had saved pornographic photos of young Japanese women he had convinced to come and work on his ranch years prior, along with shrines of the women and videos of them flexing their muscles. Another woman who ended up on the ranch found the exact same materials and claimed Pat would talk at length about how fond he was of Asian women. The most harrowing stories were of a woman who survived time alone at Pat's horse ranch but said that when they expressed their desire to leave, he would argue against it and sometimes offer to take the woman on, quote, one final horse ride in the dead of night. In the dead of winter, these women claimed that had they given in to Pat's requests, they would no longer be alive. One of Pat's full-time stable hands, a man under the moniker of Richard, was also reported to engage inappropriately with female visitors, acting like a ringleader in getting young women to be alone with his boss. We visited Pat's Facebook page for his ranch, and on a photo of this supposed Richard, a commenter wrote, quote, So you're the guy who thinks Pat is a nice normal guy, eh? You must be just as sick. I've informed the police about this site and the blog and the fact that the name changes. You must be the boy who goes to Edmonton and picks the girl out with him and talks them into going there. What part of that do you think is okay? The most curious story in relation to Amber, however, came five years ago in a woman's testimonial about how she and her friend went to work on Pat's ranch when she was 19 in order to earn a little extra cash. This is an excerpt from her story. Quote, he often brought up people who had stayed with him before and all of them had left suddenly and maybe unexpectedly. As the days went on, his welcoming nature began to give way to a very temperamental and aggressive one. I didn't really find him creepy but intolerable. I didn't like him at all. He seemed extremely socially inept and said inappropriate things. It was also extremely apparent that he did not view women as equal or anywhere near equal to men. One day he told us to get in the truck because we were going to the city. We were way out in the country so it was a long ride but he was really excited about going. He asked us to walk around and ask young people to come and work with us on the ranch. This made us super uncomfortable. We were introverts and just felt very odd to approach people and ask them to get in the truck. He got upset by our disapproval. So we got out and pretended to look for people to talk to. He also went to talk to people on his own. The reason this sticks out so much in relation to Amber's death is the confirmation that both Pat and his suspicious stable hand are both known for driving around town looking for young women, offering money and monetary help in exchange for their services. Notice that Pat also referenced traveling into the city, a verbiage mirroring what the mysterious man in Amber's phone call told her before her death. Throw in the criminal record and the predatory behavior and bizarre actions towards women of different ethnicities. And it's safe to say Pat Carson fits the profile of a disturbed and dangerous individual. This being said, the RCMP did clear him of any wrongdoing in Amber's case. Not only this, but some women who visited the ranch and shared their stories of terror remarked on Amber's case that the voice in her phone recording didn't sound like Pat, at least in their opinion. There are arguments on both sides. But theorists refuse to drop Pat as a suspect until a more in-depth investigation is carried out. Some also theorize that Richard, the stable hand, could be the voice on the Takaro phone call, perhaps picking up Amber in one of his runs through the city to convince people to come to the ranch. Another prominent theory, one raised by Tutsi Takaro herself, is that Amber was the victim of a serial killer still at large in the Leduc County area in Canada. This theory stems from multiple missing person reports of women posted throughout the county between 2000 and 2010. Four of these cases ended up as unsolved homicides when remains of four different young girls were discovered on multiple rural properties near Leddick. The first three victims were all last seen in Edmonton in April of 2003 and May of 2004. The first body was found in July of 2004, but two others weren't found until April of 2015. All four ladies were found in an eight-kilometer radius, suggesting that their killer could be the same person. There isn't much more evidence than only a pattern of gender and burial locations, but it does make one wonder if there's a more sinister scheme happening in Leduc County. In addition, you may remember us covering the Highway of Tears in a previous video earlier in 2020. About the 750-kilometer stretch of road from Prince George to Prince Rupert, Canada, in which countless women and children have gone missing or been murdered without any explanation. 
Many of the women parts of the Highway of Tears are indigenous and fit similar profiles of Amber Takaro. While Amber's murder is another 750 kilometers away from the highway's original mapping, it does make one wonder if there was a murderer targeting that specific stretch of road. Could they have expanded their territory in the hopes to throw investigators off their scent? Or did they worry about leaving behind too many clues in the same area and move westward to try and randomize their spree of terror? These are all legitimate questions with a complete lack of answers. Without a doubt, however, there could be a connection in both sets of circumstances, a connection in the mistreatment and inherent racism against indigenous peoples across all of Canada. There is certainly a sad trend in the highway of tears cases and Amber's own profile is just a microcosm of a bigger issue. While there may not be one specific or physical killer sabotaging all these women and children, it could be a similar modus operandi and mindset that these women are dying at the hands of prejudice and nationalistic evil. Groups that tout these awful ways of thinking and living could be the targets of investigation, and it's completely plausible that Amber was a victim of a hate crime or somebody who simply wanted to take advantage of an indigenous female. The final theory of prominence highlights the lack of effort given by the RCMP and fellow investigators during the height of Amber's case, specifically in the beginning. Remember that when Tootsie first called in her daughter missing, the police literally told her it wasn't going to be an issue that Amber would return her calls after a night of partying. They had absolutely zero pretense to make such a clumsy assumption and it could have been the decision that cost Amber her life. Not only this, but the Tukaro family claimed frequent mishaps by the police during their daughter's trial, citing a lack of effort and inconclusive briefings. Even the people calling in leads to the authorities, such as the three unidentified women who dropped Pat Carson's name, felt the inspectors weren't doing enough to justify their findings. Thus, theorists speculate Amber's disappearance and homicide might have been somehow related to law enforcement, perhaps committed by someone under the protection of the police. Perhaps, as some argue, this all connects back to the overall racism issue indigenous people face in Canada. Living on reservations and dealing with jurisdiction issues across the country, cases involving tribal members are often swept under the rug and forgotten about or simply never even attempted to be solved at all. Even if Amber's murder isn't that of law enforcement corruption, it could definitely be the results of higher-ups choosing to ignore her due to her background as an indigenous individual. It is a heartbreaking thought, but also a story that we are all too familiar with in many cases in Canada and around North America.